The Human Self and Iblis. Translation of Iblis O Adam. Translated and edited. Dr. Ajaz Rasul, UK. The Quranic Concept of Satan and Perspective on Human Desires, Emotions, Intellect and Wahi. Author. Ulam Ahmed Parway. 9 The Quran and Human Intellect. In the previous pages we have discussed the various means of human knowledge, its limits and restrictions and its essentials and rudiments from an intellectual point of view. Within this context it appears appropriate now that we also study the Quranic explanations and analyze the teaching presented by it using the pragmatic test. In the first part, firstly human intellect, or rational thinking, was discussed and it was described to what extent intellect is a basis for eminence and dignity for man and what great significance the Quran places on it. But together with this, also the sphere of influence and action and domain of research and investigation of the intellect itself, beyond which it cannot advance. After this, it is essential that it grasps the hand of Wahi and travels on the journey of life in its light. In other words, the relationship between Wahi and intellect should be the same as that between the light of the sun and the human eye. In the same way that without the light of the sun the presence or absence of the human eye is equal. If an individual has an eye which cannot see, for him the existence or absence of sunlight also makes no difference. Hence, in order to journey on the highway of life the need for both human intellect and the light of Wahi are intrinsically linked. 9.1 The Quran and Human Intellect. Look at the Quran from the beginning to the end. On every page you will see an invitation to intellect and vision. Indeed, the address of the Quran is to human intellect and reason itself. The biggest accusation it levels against the rejectors of hack and truth is that they do not make use of intellect and understanding. Deaf, dumb, and blind, they are void of intellect. 2. 171. It states that these people are in absolute darkness. And those who reject our laws, their condition has become such as if they are deaf and dumb, lost in the midst of darkness is profound. So for the one who wishes to tread on the wrong path, Allah's law is that he will remain wandering. And the one who wishes to tread on the straight path, will move towards successes. This is the divine law. 6. 39. The Quran declares those who do not employ intellect and reasoning to be the worst of creations. For the worst of beasts in the sight of Allah are the deaf and the dumb, those who understand not. 8. 22. It states that such people are not human beings but are cattle and sheep, indeed, beyond even them, because animals, even though they are constrained, at least remain true to their instincts. Many are the jinns and men we have made for hell. They have hearts wherewith they understand not, eyes wherewith they see not, and ears wherewith they hear not. They are like cattle, nay more misguided. For they are heedless, of warning, opening parenthesis, 7, 179. The Quran presents its invitation based on evidence, and does not ask for its acceptance to be based on blind reverence. Say, this is my way, I do invite unto Allah, on evidence clear as the seeing with one's eyes, I and whoever follows me. Glory to Allah, and never will I join gods with Allah. 12. 108. This is why it says to those who are arrogant and to those who reject to present proof and evidence to support their claim. Those who give partners to Allah will say, if Allah had wished, we should not have given partners to him, nor would our fathers. Nor should we have had any taboos. So did their ancestors argue falsely, until they tasted of our wrath. Say, have you any, certain, knowledge, if so, produce it before us. You follow nothing but conjecture. You do nothing but lie. 6. 148. But such evidence which is based on hack and certainty, 
Its basis should not be on conjecture and speculation because conjecture and speculation have no place in the face of truth. But they have no knowledge therein. About truth. Dot. They follow nothing but conjecture. And conjecture avails nothing against truth. 53. 28. This is why he has given the command, do not follow anything without knowledge and certainty, and pursue not that of which you have no knowledge. For every act of hearing, or of seeing, or of feeling in, the heart will be inquired into. 17. 36. This is because in the divine balance the one who is blind and the one who sees, the one who is deaf and the one who hears, can never be equal. These two kinds of men may be compared to the blind and deaf, and those who can see and hear well. Are they equal when compared? Will you not then take heed? 11. 24. The degree to which the Quran has emphasized knowledge and intellect is a topic in its own right, the detailed discussion of which will be covered in another book. But from the main points already mentioned a glimpse of this fact should definitely have become apparent. In light of these facts how can a thinking being state that Islam is an opponent of knowledge and reasoning? In fact it presented the eminence of intellect and intelligence before the world during that era when the world used to consider ignorance and superstition to be something for humanity to take pride in. But together with this the Quran also informs us that the intellect has its own domain and its bounty and benefit is within this very domain. 9.2 The domain of human intellect is limited. Beyond this domain it needs the guidance of the divine light of Wahi. It is an obvious fact that in order to enhance the power of the eye, external assistance is required. The eye cannot see at all in darkness. A little light, which comes from outside, increases the power of the eyesight. As the intensity of light becomes brighter, the furthest limit of our vision becomes ever more expansive. Then, if together with this light we also have binoculars, there is an even greater increase in the furthest distance of these limits. Those things which can never be visible to the eye alone become clearer and more distinct with the help of a telescope and a microscope. Similarly, the limits of the power of our hearing become increased with equipment such as loudspeakers. The same way in which the limits of these means of perception become greater with external aids, similarly the limits of the power of intellect also become expanded by the light of Wahi. Solitary intellect remains busy circling in bewilderment in the valleys of conjecture and speculation, but with the light of Wahi it reaches the level of certainty. This is because Wahi is fact and certainty and is an established reality. 9.3 Intellect and Wahi. We have stated that in the light of Wahi. 1. The sphere of the intellect becomes very vast and 2. Instead of wandering in the valleys of conjecture and speculation, it reaches the point of certainty of knowledge and conviction. Wahi defines the principles for the collective life of humanity and then tells the intellect that it should devise sub clauses for these principles and seek the means and resources for their implementation and execution. For example, the decree of Wahi is that usury is forbidden. Param. Now it is the task of the intellect that it should devise such an economic system in which business can function without usury. It is obvious that when those economic systems whose foundations are based on usury are established globally in the world, then devising a system opposite and parallel to them which is completely different from those economic systems in its basis and foundation, yet despite this should also be able to be established in the world easily, is an onerous task. Just consider, in order to devise such a system how much expanse will be created in the limited sphere of the intellect and to what proportion vastness will be created in its depths. Then also note that if no specific principle is fixed in front of the intellect then wherever it feels like it, it will halt and become static and declare that very point to be its destination. 
you will possess no criterion according to which you could say that intellect has not yet reached its intended objective, becoming weary, it has simply parked itself en route. This is the reason why the state of those nations who have devised laws for collective life based on intellect alone has remained such that. And even today the state is the same. Whatever point the intellect declared to be the destination, they settled there considering it to be the destination. But after a short while, further experiences and observations or you could say the demands of life, made this reality evident that the point which had been deemed to be the destination was not the destination. This was merely a deception of the intellect that it had concealed its inadequacy and limitations within a false interpretation of the destination. But if the principles for the collective life of humanity are defined, i. e. the destination has already been established, then the intellect which makes excuses will never be able to deceive you, because until you reach your destination you will never let it have peace. This is why it will be necessary for it to reach knowledge based on certitude rather than on conjecture and speculation. For example, you give a child a mathematical sum to work out. If you have not determined the correct answer and placed it before him then assuming whichever answer he calculates to be correct, he will sit back satisfied. But if you have worked out its correct solution and given it to him, then he will never allow his intellect to rest in peace until he has reached the answer which you have determined and supplied. This is the same state of the intellect. If you do not present principled laws before it, then at every step it will say that this is the right answer and becoming complacent will repose there. But if principled laws are present before it, then it has to reach there, willingly or unwillingly. In this way, instead of the deceptive path of conjecture and speculation, the intellect will reach the precise eminent place of knowledge and certainty. This is the difference between guidance of the intellect and guidance of wahi. This is the relationship between intellect and wahi i. e. Wahi is there to make the limits of the intellect wider and to convert its conjecture and speculation into certainty and conviction. Just as light is there to make the expanses of the eye wider and to convert its outcomes from doubt and guesswork into certitude. But in the same way that paths of error and carelessness are adopted in other matters and it is never possible to remain on the path of balance and equilibrium. In the matter of the intellect this same thing is happening among us. 9.4 Debasement of intellect is a mistake. On the one hand, Western minds which are used to the material world do not even recognize any source of knowledge other than the intellect. While on the other hand those mentalities also exist which demean and degrade intellect to such a level as though it is a punishment and curse of Allah on humanity and saving oneself from it is a sign of extreme piety and holiness. And the irony is that the logic which these people present in its support is that. Look how the intellectuals of the West are also convinced of the limitation of science and the inadequacy of the intellect. Whereas the limitation of intellect and science is another matter and to declare it as worthy of condemnation is a different thing. Science cannot advance its investigations beyond matter, this is its limitation, but within its sphere its scholarly endeavors are certainly deserving of admiration and appreciation. The domain of the intellect is the world of reasoning, it cannot step beyond this into the world of wahi. This is its shortcoming, but by this it definitely does not mean that even within its own domain it should be declared as worthy of being despised. By defining the limits of these domains, Wahi assigns its true position to everything. This is the Maslak, stance, of scholars seeking balance and truth, about whom the Quran has declared. Behold, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of night and day, there are indeed signs for men of understanding, men who celebrate the praises of Allah standing, sitting, and lying down on their sides, and contemplate the wonders of creation in the heavens and the earth. 
with the thought, Ah Rab, not for naught have you created all this. Glory to you, give us protection from the penalty of the fire. Ah Rab, any whom you do admit to the fire, truly, you cover with shame, and never will wrong. Doers find any helpers. 3. 190 to 192. These are those stages where reasoning and wahi, e, intellect and revelation, mutually embrace each other. Or you can say that the wider sphere of Iman or Wahi encompasses the smaller sphere of the intellect within itself. And by presenting its decisions in the court of Wahi, intellect continues to obtain a certification of reality without which it has no value. 9.5 Reality becomes uncovered. After this, another matter appears before us. It has been explained in the first chapter that reality reveals itself on this blessed heart which is aimed to become the trustworthy abode for this supreme secret of the universe. The laws of nature exist in the highs and lows of the universe. Man discovers these laws through his knowledge, study, experiment and observation I. E. By lifting the veils covering him, he unveils them and in this way those laws go from being unseen to becoming known. These discoveries are the consequences of human effort and skill. As man continues to make strides in his knowledge and observations, the hidden forces of nature continue to become uncovered. But this is not the situation with Wahi. In this, the recipient of Wahi does not himself lift the covers over hidden reality, he is unable to do this, instead. Reality makes itself revealed on him, and it does not do this with anyone other than a recipient of Wahi. This is the reason that Wahi is neither the outcome of human effort and skill, nor can any human being who is not a Nabi share in it. In other words, Wahi is not the outcome of the inner powers of a Nabi himself. 9.6 Wahi is external. It descends on him from outside, this is the fundamental distinction between human intellect and Wahi. The characteristic of Wahi is its objectivity which in Quranic terminology is defined by the word Tanzil. Descent. If you go through the Quran from the beginning to the end, at every point there is emphasis on the externality of Wahi and it has been explained in unambiguous words I. E. That the descent of Wahi is from the direction of Allah. It is a revelation sent down by him, the Aziz, exalted in might, the Rahim, the sustainer. 36. 5. And in another verse. The revelation of this book is from Allah, the exalted in power, full of wisdom. Verily it is we who have revealed the book to you in truth. So serve Allah, offering him sincere devotion, by following his laws. 39, 1-2. Gabriel the trustworthy descended with it. Say, whoever is an enemy to Jibril for he brings down the revelation to your heart by Allah's will, a confirmation of what went before, and guidance and glad tidings for those who have Iman. 2. 97. The being of Allah is free from all aspects of space and direction, hence, by the descent of Wahi is not meant that some entity does in actual fact come from a higher direction to a lower direction. Allah is closer even than our jugular vein. It was we who created man, and we know what dark suggestions his self makes to him. For we are nearer to him than his jugular vein. Nothing is hidden from us. Dot. Opening parenthesis. 50. 16. Therefore, by the externality of Wahi the real purpose is to impart that this is not a product of the human mind, nor is there is any role of effort and skill on the part of the recipient of Wahi. 9.7 Wahi is not an acquired skill, as has been written in the first chapter. If Wahi can be gained through effort and skill, then in whatever environment the messenger is born in, brought up in, develops, is nourished and thrives in, there are other people in that environment as well. If any individual has the potential to acquire Wahi through skill, then this potential can exist in other men as well. 
But wah he is not an acquired thing. It is such an endowment that for this supreme status of responsibility the mashrat of Allah. Divine will makes a selection of a specific eminent personality from this very same environment and makes his purified heart the abode for the light of Wahi. Allah chooses messengers from Malaika and from men, for Allah is he who hears and sees all things. 22, 75. About the messenger Yunus it is declared. Thus did his Rab choose him and made him of the company of the righteous. 68, 50. About Moses it is announced. And I have prepared you for myself, for service. 20, 41. When the messenger preaches the message of Wahi, the people around him are surprised, because he says such things of which they have absolutely no expectation from him. They consider him to be one of them and have similar expectations of him. But along with the descent of Wahi he begins to talk about some other world. When the messenger Salah forbade his people from that shirk which was continuing among them from their forefathers, they exclaimed in surprise. They said, O oh Salah, you have been of us, a center of our hopes hitherto. Do you, now, forbid us from following what our forefathers worshipped? But we are really in suspicious, disquieting, doubt as to that to which you, invite us. 11. 62. Neither is this great blessing ancestral or tribal. In relation to the eminent mention of Abraham, the Quran states. And remember when Abraham was put through various challenges of life under the divine laws, he obeyed every law fully. When this took place, he said, I will make you an imam to mankind. He, Abraham, pleaded, and also, imams, from my offspring, he answered but my promise is not within the reach of evildoers. 2. 124. 9.8 Wahi is based on Masharat alone. Wahi is Allah's raiment which is based solely on his will. It is never the wish of those without Iman, among the people of the book, nor of the pagans, that anything good should come down to you from your Rab. But Allah will choose for his special raiment whom he will, for Allah is Rab of grace abounding. 2. 105. Only the being of Allah possesses knowledge of which righteous being will be selected for this distinguished responsibility. Allah knows best, where, and how to carry out his mission. 6. 124. In Surah and Nal it is stated. He does send down his malaika with rue of his command, to such of his servants as he pleases. Saying, Warn, man, that there is no, God but I, so live your life according to my laws. 16. 2. In Surah al momin it is said, Raised high above ranks, or degrees, on the throne, of authority, by his command does he send our rue, wahi to any of his servants he pleases, that it may warn men of the day of mutual meeting. 40. 15. Since this bestowal is based on Masharat, if Masharat wishes to remove it then no one can bring it back. If it were our will, we could take away that which we have sent you by Wahi. Then would you find none to plead your affair in that matter as against us. 17. 86. 9.9 .9 Pure Endowment. The state of this exclusivity and selection is such that, as has been stated previously, prior to Risalat, messengerhood, even the messenger himself has no knowledge of this, that he is being prepared for this distinguished responsibility. When Moses set out in search of fire for his family, he saw a burning light in the distance. He took it to be simply a flame of fire and approached it with great naivety. When he reached near it, a voice arose from the blessed. Vastness. I have chosen you. Listen, then, to the Wahi. 20. 13. Even that being himself, Rasul Ullah, who had knowledge of humanity, was a teacher of wisdoms, appointed at the supreme height for the eminence and guidance of humanity. 
and was illuminating the highest horizon of knowledge and intellect. Before receiving Wahi, he also had no knowledge as to what is a book, and what it is that is called Iman. And thus have we, by our command, sent Wahi to you. You knew not, before, what was revelation, and what was Iman. But we have made the Quran, a light wherewith we guide such of our servants as we will, according to our law of guidance. And verily you do guide men to the straight path. 42, 52. He was neither aware, nor was he expecting that he would receive Nabuwat. And you had not expected that the book would be sent to you except as a raiment from your Rab. Therefore, lend not your support to any that reject the Quran. 28, 86. Before the receipt of Wahi he knows neither how to write nor how to read, but he is being made the recipient of that Nur. Light, from which those acquiring light will be acknowledged as Imam of knowledge and wisdom in the whole world. And you were not able to recite a book before this book came, nor are you able to transcribe it with your right hand. In that case, indeed, would the talkers of vanities have doubted. 29, 48. This is the reason why the surrounding people used to be astonished that he was a man from amongst us. How did Wahi begin to descend on him? Is it a matter of wonderment to men that we have sent our Wahi to a man from among themselves? That he should warn mankind of the danger and give the good news to Mominin that they have before their Rab the lofty rank of truth. But, say the unbelievers, this is indeed an evident sorcerer. 10, 2, see also, 38, 4. This is why these people who were unfamiliar with the reality of Wahi, used to say, why does Allah not talk to us? Say those without knowledge, why speaks not Allah unto us? Or why comes not unto us a sign? So said the people before them words of similar import. Their hearts are alike. We have indeed made clear the signs unto any people who hold firmly to Iman. 2. 118. 9.10 How is this selection made? But by the choice of messenger and receipt of Wahi it does not mean that. Allah forbid. When the gaze rests on someone walking by, just select him for this responsibility. Can you imagine when Divine Masharat made the selection of a man for the power of intellect and reason? Made it worthy of this capacity after causing this figure of clay and water to journey through umpteen evolutionary stages. Then on what a high stature of eminence of humanity will be that illustrious being who is going to be selected for a supreme blessing like Wahi. And whose enlightened heart is going to be made a trustee of the secrets and mysteries of the universe. In Surah Sa'd, after mentioning the Anbiya, it is stated. Each of them was of the company of the best. 38, 48. They were all of them the righteous ones in the universe, and were the best of creation and manifestations of supreme character traits. And you were on an exalted standard of character. 68, 4. Hence, in order to understand this reality, how training begins under the guidance of Allah of that being who is intended to ultimately be appointed for the task of Nabuwat and through how many different stages he is passed through to bring him to the point of Nabuwat, study the account of Moses in Surah Taha. The narrative commences with 20, 36, in which it is described in what environment Moses was born, under what circumstances he arrived at the palaces of Pharaoh and how he was brought up there. Then how by removing him from the life of those palaces, he was sent to the pastoral life of Madian, and while there, what kinds of endurance testing stages he was passed through. After details of all of these destinations and stages, it is declared. Then did you come hither as ordained, O Moses? 20. 40. O Moses. After traversing all of these stages, only then have you fulfilled our criteria. And after this it is stated, And I have prepared you for myself. 
for service. 20. 41. In this way a Nabi is prepared for the stature of Nabuwat but he himself has no knowledge for what purpose his training is being carried out like this. From this it is evident that Nabuwat is not obtained by effort and skill I. E. It is not that by following a specific technique and by doing special kinds of religious rituals that an individual can achieve Nabuwat. Other kinds of knowledge of the world can be acquired in this way but not knowledge of Nabuwat. This is the reason why knowledge of Nabuwat is completely different from mysticism and intuition I. E. Not only is there a difference of degree between both but the nature of both is completely different. This difference is not quantitative but is qualitative. The example of Nabuwat cannot be found in any other knowledge of the world. Nabuwat is an example in its own right, it is not the name of an enhanced form of some inner potential of an individual. It is an entirely distinct entity which a non-Nabi can never understand. At this juncture it is necessary to clarify a point. As has been written above, the eyes of nature carry out the supervision and protection right from the beginning of that individual who has been aimed to be selected for the eminent stature of Nabuwat and the descent of Wahi. On him occurs from outside, but this does not mean that a Nabi has no personal abilities and potentials. He is not, Allah forbid, like a radio set through which the voice of Wahi is broadcasted. With respect to his character and conduct a Nabi is at the highest level, and after obtaining Wahi from Allah, the great revolution he unleashes in the human world is all. In the light of Wahi, owed to his personal abilities, details of this topic will be covered under the subject of Risalat. 9.11 Pragmatic Test we had also said that one great criterion by which to verify Wahi is the pragmatic test. Now let us examine this aspect. Since the only authentic and unadulterated treatise in the world of Wahi is the Quran, therefore in this connection only the teaching of the Quran will be presented. And the truth is that wherever the light of Wahi came, its teaching was fundamentally and principally the same as that which is within the Quran. As a point of principle, there simply cannot be any disparity in the teaching of Wahi. A difference only occurs at that time when human tampering in the teaching of Wahi results in alterations. And then from this teaching a few matters of principle will also be able to be presented because all the volumes of Mararif al-Quran are dedicated to its elucidation. And even after this it cannot be assumed that its teaching has been completed. 9.12 Shirk. Now turn the pages of history back to the 6th century and see what was the state of the collective human condition in that era in the whole world. In this era Persia, Greece, Egypt and Rome were mighty centers of civilization and culture. Let us first examine the belief systems and you will see that in these times Shirk was prevailing over every aspect of thought and outlook in some form or another. And this ideology was not only confined to the superstitions of the illiterate. Even the greatest of scholars possessing wisdom and vision were seen to be suffering in the darknesses of this greatest injustice. Greek wisdom is viewed as being the most shining model of knowledge and enlightenment, but in his court case Socrates acknowledged this fact that he believes the moon and the sun to be gods. Today, because the true greatness of Tawhid is generally not present before us, regarding shirk to be merely a debate about a belief, we move on. But if you scrutinize this closely, then you will see that shirk and Tawhid are not merely issues of oratory exchange, instead their connection is directly related to the principles and fundamental discourses of life. Just reflect that when man bows down before the artifacts carved by his own hands, or the manifestations of nature, can any iota of the eminence of humanity then remain in him? Those nations of the world to whom a share of success and prosperity falls, they first of all attain human stature, the prerequisite for which is that man does not bow down before someone lower than him or equal to him. 
This bowing down does not only mean that he should not bow before some figure made of stone or clay. Rather its meaning is that he should acknowledge only the law of one Allah, just as in the universe there is only one law in implementation and operation, and that is the law of Allah, which is called the law of nature. In the same way, only the law of Allah which is received through Wahi should be operational in human society. But if some individual considers some other individual's law or his own self-created law as deserving of his obedience, then this will be the greatest. Shuk. 9.13 The sum total of character. After beliefs, let us move on to the collective character. Malukiat. Dictatorship was an accepted structure in the system of government and no voice used to be raised against it. Never mind raising a voice in opposition, it had acquired such a status of reverence that it was accepted as a divine right. And along from this the chains of priesthood gripped every nook and cranny of the heart and mind from every direction. In social life, the division of human beings into sects based on race was being carried out. The vanquishing and erosion of these iron walls of castes and sub-castes was not within the remit of anyone. The confines of color and race, and country and nation, had split mankind into fragments, the essential outcome of which was that instead of the criterion for the dignity of being human simply that of being human, it was declared to be that of different affiliations and identifications. Nowhere was man recognized as being a human being. Instead his rights and dues were defined according to country and descent, and family and tribe. During man's era of ignorance, theft was called a crime if it was within one's own tribe, and a deed worthy of appreciation if it was in another tribe. But this distinction, extending beyond the valley of ignorance, had become the principle of life in the arena of civilization too. So much so that according to Roman law, people out with the boundaries of the country were not considered to be human beings. Within the boundaries of the kingdom the rights of citizenship as a free man and its associated benefits were available. But out with these borders all human beings were considered to be savages and enemies. Now let us come on to the economic system where capitalism was exactly the same kind of established system just like Malukiat. One branch of these non-natural systems of life was the curse of slavery, which had become declared to be an intrinsic part of the human collective character. In the household of Aristotle there were seventy slaves and he used to give seventy reasons for the legitimacy of slavery. All in all, cast an eye on any aspect of the history of the civilized world of this era, and everywhere the pattern of life was similar to this. Leaving aside any word of complaint rising to the lips in opposition to this pattern of life. There used to be no qualms or heaviness felt anywhere within the depths of the hearts even, as if this style of life was understood to be perfectly in line with human nature. Just ponder that in this environment, from the ignorant and savage land of Arabia, a human being stands up. As has been noted previously, he should have been the same as the people around him and even if his intellectual level is assumed to be higher than the people around him, then at the very most he could have been declared to be a wise man of that civilized world. And what the condition was of the civilized world of that era has been discussed above. 9.14 The revolution brought by Wahi. But that individual rises and raises the flag of rebellion against every single one of those aspects of that structure of life which was declared as being precisely in accordance with nature by the civilization and culture and knowledge and wisdom of that era. He becomes introduced as the claimant of such a revolution in which the very foundations of this structure of lies are uprooted and cast aside. He declares Malukia to be the worst curse of Allah. Superstition is stated to be contrary to human dignity and he pronounces priesthood to be a saintly veil of self-deception. The division of caste and creed is counted as among the tyranny of Pharaonic powers. 
According to him the capitalist system is like a leprosy which has filled the body of humanity with fatal pathogens. His soul shivers at the thought of slavery. His proclamation about nationalism is that man acquires the form of bloodthirsty beasts as a consequence of this. He rises up and calling on the whole world, proclaims that no human being has the right to rule over another human being. He states that the connection of man with Allah is direct. For this, there is no need for any intermediate medium of priesthood. He announces that the criterion for human eminence and dignity, and status and righteousness, is his character and deeds, the foundation of which is on Iman. No man has priority and superiority over another human being by virtue of birth. He states that capitalism is nothing more than that a few men, by acquiring power, have usurped the rights of weak and helpless human beings. Hence, the demand of justice and accountability is that these usurped rights are wrested back from the hands of these usurpers and returned to the rightful claimants. He declares accumulation and hoarding to be a severe crime in the economic system and announces that the circulation of wealth should not be in such a way that it remains circulating within one particular category. He states that man as simply being a human being is in itself a reason for respect for him, hence even the very notion of slavery among human beings cannot arise by shattering all tribal and national prejudices. He makes the announcement of this supreme revolution that the whole of mankind is one as a result of its origin. Therefore all people on the face of the earth are members of one universal brotherhood and are branches of one high and mighty tree. The creation of differentiation and differences among them through the unnatural barriers of race, color, language and nationhood is the breaking into pieces of the body of humanity. So much so, that he makes a proclamation against all the non-natural laws and constitutions of human life. Individual and collective, and not only does he make a proclamation, but also by generating a revolution in practical terms demonstrates what is the true significance of human life. 9.15 Concept of the Unity of Life this colossal revolution created from his direction in the internal and external world of people is based on this discovery of reality according to which, by immersing himself into the ultimate depths of the soul of the universe, he sees with his own eyes the true principle of the oneness of life. Who created you from a single cell? 4. 1. The fact is that the discovery of the supreme reality of the unity of life is that intellectually astounding revolution which transformed all false viewpoints of human intellect and vision, and according to which a new model of human collective life emerged along correct lines. This concept presented by the Quran is in reality a decisive demarcation between the ancient and modern worlds. From here, the direction of the flow of the system of humanity became transferred towards another direction which, having shattered the unnatural boundaries of race and nation, awakened the concept of universality in human consciousness. In its very first sentence the Quran has made this reality of supreme stature clear, that the Allah, Rab al alamin whose teaching is that he is the provider of nourishment to all nations and creations, then in this system there can be no imposition of national prejudice and party affiliation. His addressee is man, not any particular group of men. The Quran is a code of life for all the nations of the world. 6. 90. Its declaration is that this book of guidance is a syllabus of life for mankind. O oh mankind, there has come to you a direction from your Rab and a healing for the diseases in your hearts, and for those who have Iman, a guidance and a raiment. 10. 57. It is apparent that in the social and political system which will take shape according to human intellect, there will certainly be some kind of inclination to one side or another, whether consciously or unconsciously. As long as a human being has a beating heart in his chest, 
He can never be free from the bias of emotions, and it is the demand of the emotions that these accept the colorful allurements of the environment and surroundings. But the source of Wahi is pure and beyond all of these predilections and proclivities, this is why in front of Wahi all men are equal. By Rab al Alamin, Rab of all the worlds, is meant Rabubiyat for all. The meaning of Rabubiyat is that whatever latent potentials there are within each individual, the development, training, of all these should occur in such a way that they can reach their completion. This is the society which the Quran wishes to establish I. E. Such a society in which the potentials of every human being can attain complete development. This means completion of the self or individuality. This is called the development of the self. This is the fundamental teaching of the Quran. 9.16 Individual Life it is obvious that in this system no individual is dependent on another. But this system goes one step beyond even this and announces that nourishment of individuals does not mean that each individual should sit alone and separate from all others. It states that in the same way that these potentials of individuals become completed within a collective society, Shaping of this collective society also takes place through the coming together and interaction of these same individuals. In this system individuals dedicate all of their potentials for the purpose of strengthening the collective life and in this way the manifestation of life in a collective form keeps becoming stronger and stronger. Together with this, Resilience and balance keep developing in the selves of individuals, and in this way such a circle becomes established in which it becomes difficult to tell who is advancing on whose strength. Individuality and collectivity are mutually embedded in a similar way to the human body and within it its life cells. The survival of the whole body is conditional on the life of the cells and the life of the cells is conditional on the life of the body. The body provides energy to the cells and the cells to the body. The existence of both is separate and both together are also one. Or you can understand it through another example. Like a flywheel gives movement to the parts of a machine. And the parts of the machine then turn this flywheel, and in this way such a process becomes established based on mutual cooperation and assistance. In fact, discipline and control, through which one cannot be separated from the other. When the egos of individuals adopt the form of collectivism under this system, then since there is similarity in their individual attributes, hence through this similarity and congruence, mutual harmony is created among them. And through this mutual harmony such an environment comes into existence in which there are the means for the nourishment of these egos. In this environment every individual receives full opportunity to develop his latent potentials. 9.17 The Balance of Justice In this system every matter is based on principle, and its decision is enacted according to a specific order and law in which there is neither a favor to anyone nor any injustice. We sent aforetime our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the balance, of right and wrong, that men may stand forth in justice. And we sent down iron, in which is, material for, mighty war, as well as many benefits for mankind. All these things are sent so that an era of peace and security may be established in the world. That Allah may test who it is that will help, unseen, him and his messengers. For Allah is full of strength, exalted in might and able to enforce his will. 57. 25. Reflect on the above verse and see that the purpose from this process of righteous guidance, law and balance, etc. is informed as being this, that justice can be upheld among mankind. This is why the aim of the Quran is the growth and well-being of the whole of mankind, while that which is for the good of mankind remains on the earth. 13. 17. 
and this is that high and superior aim which is suitable to be declared as the purpose of mankind and on which, in reality, the foundation of all deeds should be placed. Discussing this problem, Samuel writes, Welfare is the aim, and welfare consists not in one thing but in many. So there is a broad conception of welfare comprising many varied elements, spiritual and intellectual, moral and material, social and personal. This is the good, which men should seek. In other words, such a code of life whose sights should be set upon the good of the whole of mankind, and good which is not only for one department of life but for the entirety of life. This is the very reason that in the case of justice and impartiality, the Quran permits no allowance for any distinction and difference between those who are our own or strangers, near ones or distant ones. So much so, that its decree is, and let not the hatred of others to you make you swerve to wrong and depart from justice. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness. 5. 8. You can imagine from this to what great heights human equality reaches under the system of life defined by the light of Wahi. This is because the foundation of this structure is oneness of the Creator, and the oneness of life which is a principle without precedence. There is no doubt in this that the Quran divides people according to Iman and Kufa, but in this division there is not an iota of injustice or compulsion. The meaning of this division is that those people who wish to shape the system of life based on the great principle quoted above, they are members of one Jamaat and those who, in opposition to it, wish to establish the system of life according to the self-made laws of men, they are members of the other Jamaat. And it is obvious that due to such a basic and fundamental difference in ideology and practice, it is necessary to have separation and differentiation. But, as has been written above, in this separation and differentiation also, injustice can never be allowed to exist in any form whatsoever. The basic rights of humanity will be equal for both a Momen and a Kafir. Details will be covered later. On the basis and foundation of the oneness of ideology and practice, Islam established the towering structure of true unity and equality, observing which even outsiders acknowledge that this is in truth what is called equality. Christianity is itself a claimant of equality and impartiality but regarding the difference between Islamic equality and Christian equality, let us hear from the lips of a Christian missionary. She, Dr. Agnes Maud Royden, writes, The Religion of Muhammad. Muhammad proclaimed the first real democracy ever conceived in the mind of man. His God was of such transcendent greatness that before him all worldly differences were nougat and even the deep and cruel cleavage of color ceased to count. There are social ranks among Muslims as elsewhere, but fundamentally, that is to say, spiritually, all believers are equal. And this fundamental spiritual equality is not a fiction as so commonly among Christians. It is accepted and is real. This accounts very largely for its extraordinary rapid spread among different peoples. It accounts for its strength today in Africa, where a Christian missionary preaches equality which is everywhere mocked by the arrogance of the white races and the existence of the color bar. The Muslim, black, brown or white alone finds himself accepted as a brother not according to his color but his creed. And this is the state even today in an era when the teaching of Islam has become a tale from the past. Can you say that these concepts could in any way possible ever be the creation of human intellect? And in what era were these concepts of life put forward? In that era when certain such beliefs were prevalent in the whole world which were fundamentally absolutely different from them. 9.18 The world is coming in this very direction. Now let us take another step forward from this. The world opposed these revolutionary concepts of life and opposed them with the full force of the heart. But then after this, what took place in these 1300 years? Ask this of these opponents themselves, not us.
Man, stumbling repeatedly, slowly and gradually, without noticing it, is advancing towards these very same concepts of life which he opposed so vehemently. His state is such that he establishes a system based on his intellect alone but becoming jaded in its hands, he demolishes and pulverizes it himself. During this disintegration and fragmentation he has to undergo great sacrifices. But when humanity emerges from this bloodbath, then its footstep is lifted towards this same system whose voice was raised from the soil of the Arabian Peninsula during the darknesses of the 6th century A. D. Reflect on the French Revolution, how it declared the concept of Malukia to be false. Consequently, today the concept of the divine rights of kings is declared to be a memory from the age of ignorance. Samuel, while discussing Christianity, writes, It, Christianity, has supported the doctrine of the divine right of kings and must bear responsibility for all the evil consequences of that doctrine in the history of Europe. Together with Malukiat, the concept of the divine rights of priesthood is also being gradually erased. Samuel writes, as history informs us, belief in priesthood has remained as a stumbling block in the path of economic progress. The existence of slavery has almost disappeared. The revolution which has taken place in the economic system of the world after the Second World War does not require any elaboration. Nationalism was considered to be the hallmark of modern civilization. But due to the Second World War the manifestations of that which is arising against it in human hearts appear before us frequently. Iqbal had stated, Nature is constructing a new Adam in the depths of life and a new world for his abode. The hazy outlines of the construction of this new Adam and this new world rise up and appear before us every other day from the particles of dust of the West. After viewing the whole world with his own eyes, the conclusion which the renowned American politician Wendell L. Wilkie reached, is a reflection of that change in hearts in this respect which is tossing and turning in the world of humanity. He had written, We have been a people devoted largely to home enterprise. We began to grow up with the earlier world war. We are only now changing completely from a young nation of domestic concerns to an adult nation of international interests and world outlook. We have written above that according to the Quran the criterion between us and others is not of color and race but is of oneness of ideology and practice. In this regard, Wilkie writes, Let me emphasize once more that race and color do not determine what people are allies and what people are enemies in this struggle. And a bit later he writes, America must choose one of three courses. After this war, I, narrow nationalism, which inevitably means the ultimate loss of our own liberty. E, international imperialism, which means the sacrifice of some other nation's liberty. E, or the creation of a world in which there shall be an equality of opportunity for every race and every nation. I am convinced the American people will choose, by overwhelming majority, the last of these courses. Have you noticed how the world, by emerging from the dark valleys of nationalism, is coming towards the harmonious expanses of humanity? Bear these facts in mind and reflect. With this evolution of knowledge and intelligence, is the world progressing towards that system which was given to it 1300 years ago or is it opposing it? You will see without any iota of doubt or speculation that after trial and error of each and every aspect of the non-divine system of life, the world keeps abandoning it, and in this way, by a process of elimination is now steadily marching towards the correct system of life. And in this way all its wisdom and intelligence is in reality bowing down on the eminent threshold of that presenter of the revolution who proclaimed that divine system for the collective life of mankind which is precisely in line with human evolution. And together with this he also made this proclamation that this system is not a creation of my intellect, instead its source is the knowledge of Allah. Wahi.
After this, does any need remain for some other evidence about the truth of Wahi? And furthermore, when you have seen the links in this system presented by that eminent and distinguished being in the light of your intellect and reasoning, tested it through experience and observation that it is in fact based on reality, then is it not an inevitable conclusion from this that this reality should be acknowledged, that the part of its teaching on which the world has not yet been able to act cannot be wrong? The proponent of this revolution had stated 1300 years ago, do not reject this teaching just because it is not within your comprehension yet. It is indeed based on vision and wisdom from top to bottom. The level of your knowledge and intelligence has not yet risen so high that you can encompass it. Consequently, as the level of human knowledge and intelligence kept rising, man witnessed how truthful this claim was. Then does this conclusion not follow from this, that whatever part is remaining it should also be acknowledged that it is precisely in line with knowledge and vision. But so far the intellectual level of our time has not yet risen to that level from which it can acknowledge its truth. 9.19 European system is not Islamic. At this juncture it is considered necessary to enlighten a point. Although Europe has evaluated some parts of the Quranic system of life on the basis of knowledge and intellect, it has not implemented this system completely in a practical form. It has borrowed small parts at some places. But the Quranic system cannot be divided up into constituents and portions. It is a complete system which it is necessary to adopt in full. It is a machine whose every part is functioning in its own assigned place. By the taking out of its parts and fitting these into different machines, the results from the original machine can never be established. This is why it is stated, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. 2. 208. This system will have to be accepted as a complete whole, as the mixing of hack and battle is shirk. The constituents of the Quranic and non-Quranic system cannot be combined together. The truth is that the real issue is not about different social or political laws and constitutions but is about that foundation on which the whole structure is established. And this foundation is the acceptance of this supreme reality that the establishment of the correct system of humanity is only possible in the light of that teaching which is based on comprehending. Complete reality. The source of this teaching is Wahi and its other name is Iman Billa. Although Western thinkers of the modern era are emerging from the darkness of the mechanical concept of the universe, that complete concept of Allah, the wise and omniscient, which Wahi puts forward has not appeared before them, though its vague signs are being felt here and there. And it is obvious that when the foundation itself has not yet been shaped on the correct lines, then how can the structure built on it be conceived to be true? This is the reason that in the political field, whether it is the system of Western democracy, or in the economic world the communist doctrine, or other similar kinds of laws and constitutions, these can never be declared as an Islamic system. The most that can be said about them is that these are voices of protest against those laws in which humanity is continuing shackles until this time. And this voice has been raised under the influence of that which the Quranic teaching has created imperceptibly in the environment. This is the very reason that they are extremely unhappy at the hands of the system of life which is established in Europe today and are in search of such a system which can convert this anxiety and unhappiness into peace. And in this search they are certainly becoming aware of this fact that the foundation of this system can only be based on the correct religion, not on intellect alone. In this regard Samuel writes, The world does indeed urgently need religion. Man will not live like beasts of the field forever, intend only on material things and physical satisfactions. A spiritual striving is innate. The intellectual conviction that the universe we perceive is not all leaves us with a sense of void. 
We have been asked to believe many incredible things, but that there is nothing to be believed would be the most incredible of all. It is due to the absence of this Iman that today the world is becoming a hell of dissatisfaction, and in the search of which every gaze with foresight is roaming desperately. According to Professor Coburn, anyone who has held that a man can live without faith should study the youth of today in their pathetic quest for something to believe in. It is the ever-illuminating lamp of Iman which causes this truth to become unveiled on man that life is not an thing to be measured on the scales of today and tomorrow, it is a perpetually flowing stream in front of whose continuity and infinitude the Milky Way is also just like some dust on a path. In this regard Professor Jode writes, It is life's dynamism that induces man with aspirations. This is what inspires it to creativity and unravel the truths and thus it struggles ahead, but faith was lost when this corporeal being was thought to be the ultimate aim. 9.20 Iman and Character It is Iman itself which produces correct results in any system. Even the best of systems cannot produce results until the people at the helm of affairs operate it with the purity of their hearts and vision. If you judge a system via mathematical calculations, it will demonstrate extremely pleasant results but in the practical world its outcomes will not manifest as such. This is because if this system is implemented through machines then external influences will have no effect on it. But in place of machines, it is implemented through the hearts and minds of human beings. Accordingly, until in this system there is the ability for purification of the intellect and vision it will not be able to produce pleasant outcomes. The foundation of the system which is established through Wahi is on this great fact that eminence of character is inherently mandatory for the Jamaat running this system. Also, for eminence of character it does not adopt any outside means. Instead, this attribute exists within this system, by obedience of which purification is automatically produced in the heart and mind. In fact, you could say that this is the very first thing which is produced, everything else is a consequence of it. The Quran states, Allah has promised to those who have Iman and do righteous deeds, that he will establish them in the earth. 2455 This means that establishment in the land is the natural outcome of Iman and righteous deeds and these are the foundations on which the citadel of character and conduct rises. You can understand it as this, that by the establishment of this system eminence of character is produced within man. And due to this eminence of character strength is produced in the system, and in this way it becomes such a circle that all the blessings of the earth and heavens are encompassed within it. The Quran states, And for a paradise whose width is that of the whole of the heavens and of the earth. 3. 133. This is that system whose basis is on Iman and without Iman character cannot acquire resoluteness. According to Huxley, religious consciousness is an essential basis for character. In this system balanced conduct based on its dynamic outcomes will continually be a reason for growth in courage and heightening of fortitude. In this society the criterion for dignity and stature will be taqwa alone I. E. This reality that who is the one who maintains his life in harmony with the laws of Allah the most. In this society every individual will enjoin others to pursue and remain steadfast on this program producing concrete, constructive results. And, join together, in the mutual teaching of truth, and of patience and constancy. 103. 3. Wrong will be considered as being wrong at every point and place, and good will be considered as being good, and it is in this that the secret of the success and growth of humanity lies. Stuart Mill writes, Undoubtedly mankind would be in a deplorable state if no principle of justice. Moral veracity, beneficence were taught publicly or privately and the opposite vices repressed by the praise and blame, the favorable and unfavorable sentiments of 
mankind, and these principles of justice and impartiality will not remain confined to some specific nation or country, rather their expansiveness will encompass the whole of mankind in its lap. This is the teaching of Wahi and today the demands of the times have caused every thinking being to reach this conclusion. The emphasis of religion was first laid upon the salvation of the individual soul. Then, when the importance of social morality came to be recognized, it stressed the virtue also of social effort and sacrifice. Now that there is urgent need for the strengthening of the foundation of an international morality, it is upon that as well that the religions are called upon to focus their action. The times demand a simultaneous parallel movement by all the churches everywhere to promote world fellowship through religion. 9.21 character is dependent on Iman. We have stated that eminence and fortitude is produced in the human character through Iman. In the world of human interaction it is possible that you may declare honesty to be the best policy. Course of action, as a matter of convenience, or in order to gain respect in society and to live a life of popularity in the world you espouse honesty and a path of good relationships. It is also possible that you may consider this path to be better according to wisdom and reasoning, or you may naturally happen to be humble, balanced, well-mannered and compassionate. Or considering some works of charity and donation as being noble acts, you carry these out as a matter of custom. Nothing among these can be called steadfastness of character. Eminence of character has neither any connection with decisions of the intellect, nor with customary acts and conduct. Strength of character and eminence is connected to a conversion of the heart. Its whole structure becomes raised and organized on the foundations of the heart. Until the time that a revolution does not take birth within the world of the heart. Until the points of view are not transformed, until then purification of thought and righteous deeds are not possible. And beautification and adornment of character is the very name of purification and organization of thought and vision, and not of decisions based on intellect alone. In Iqbal's words, even if the individual recited that there is no ilah, what is gained, if the heart and vision is non-Muslim, then there is nothing. This is the reason that philosophy cannot become the vehicle to make the character eminent I. E. Eminence of character is related not to the world of reason but to the world of action, whose foundation is on Iman. In the words of Schumberge, philosophical terms cannot express human feelings. They fail to sound any chord in our souls. They create no echo or response. They cannot awaken a lively thought in us by their purely intellectual concepts. We have already stated in the discussion about nafs that as vastness and loftiness keep emerging within the human self, the attributes of Allah, ultimate ego, keep manifesting in it, within human limits. This is what is called eminence of character, until the time that transformation does not take place in the world of the heart along this pattern. The dependency of character is on intellectual decisions, on which complete trust can never be placed. The consequence of reflecting the divine attributes in the human self is that all human desires and hopes, inclinations and dispositions, yearnings and demands, wishes and urges keep on becoming mutually harmonious with that source of balance and virtue, this is what is called eminence and loftiness of character. Alama Iqbal writes, but the aspiration of religion soars higher than that of philosophy. Philosophy is an intellectual view of things, and as such, does not care to go beyond a concept which can reduce all the rich variety of experience to a system. It sees reality from a distance as it were. Religion seeks closer contact with reality. The one is theory. The other is living experience, association, intimacy. In order to achieve this intimacy thought must rise higher than itself, and find its fulfillment in an attitude of mind which religion describes as prayer. Do a supplication, one of the last words on the lips of the Prophet of Islam.
9.22 Meaning of Dua What is Dua? A beautiful desire to become mutually harmonious with the ultimate melody of the musical voice of nature. The agitated desire to become one color with the heart enchanting beauties being manifested of the unveiling reality. The fervent, intense desire in the breast of a partridge to clasp the moon within its breast like the Milky Way. The enthusiasm and excitement in the heart of a moth to absorb the style and manner of the euphoric and dancing flame of the burning torch I. E. The fierce desire of the human self to continue to make its finite expanse ever wider. And for the satisfaction of this desire the beautiful demand of the dewdrop for the wings of an eagle from the rays of the sun. If we observe closely, then we will see that Iman, Dua and Deed are all rays of one flame and petals of one flower. Iman is the name of the acknowledgement of this truth that the secret of the elevation of human character is concealed in the mutual harmony with the center of goodness and virtue of the worldly. System. Dua is the intense craving for this harmony and one color, and action is the live manifestation of this craving and the resolute pursuit in its achievement. The renowned psychologist William James writes, It seems probable that in spite of all that science may do to the contrary, men will continue to pray to the end of time. In any event why he creates such a system in which the character of the followers of this system converts into a distinct mold which is supreme and beautiful I. E. An amazing model of persuasion, protection, expansiveness, assertiveness. In which this beautiful combination of opposing constituents of acceptance and willingness and supremacy and control becomes the cause for keeping the system of mankind at a point of balance. 9.23 Superman as defined by Nietzsche. The cause for the affliction in which Europe is trapped today is that it has that concept of Superman in front of it which is a creation of the teaching of Nietzsche, and in which blind force appears as molded solely in a material form. About the characteristics of Nietzsche's Superman, A. H. J. Knight writes in his book, Freedom from ethical restrictions, for great ends. Active, creative greatness. Joy, these shall be good. Fetters shall be thrown off and authority denied. This life shall be accepted as the only life, and as good, though terrible. All that impedes greatness, power, beauty, shall be abolished. As there is no soul without body, there can be no spiritual greatness where the body is sick. Therefore, health is immediately valuable. Pity is a sickness or selfishness. It hinders action or serves to give an unhealthy pleasure to the pettier. Hardness is virtue beyond all price. Just reflect, that civilization which rises on the concept of blind forces of materialism, how painful will its outcomes be for the world. Until the time that power is not under the obeisance of Wahi, peace can never be established in the world. We had started the discussion by saying that the method by which to assess the teaching of Wahi is pragmatic I. E. You can see from its outcomes what its teaching is like. In this regard if we want to see what is the system that the Quran presents, whose example and parallel cannot be found anywhere else in the world, and what the fruits and outcomes of this system will be. Then refer to my book titled The Quranic System of Sustenance, in which the fundamental teaching of the Quran and its pleasant outcomes are presented in a very clear manner. From there you will also get the answer to this question that if the system of Islam is the possessor of such successful and joyous outcomes, then why did it end after enduring for a short time only and why did it not progress further?